Raghunath, are you ready? Can we formally introduce you? Yes, please. Okay. I'm the very can much we ready. have the slide for introduction, please? So I think Dr. Hafizur is held up. So I'll go ahead and introduce our second speaker. Dr. Girija Vag is the Vice President-Elect of Foxy. She's been the Vice President of the India Chapter of this process since 2014. As you just heard, she was very much an important part of the drafting of the Foxy ICOG gestosis, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, GCPR or good clinical practice recommendations, which we published in 2019, where Dr. Gorok and I were there when the health minister released it in Bhubaneswar. Dr. Giri Jawag is also a senior consultant at multiple hospitals in Pune, including the Cloud9 and the Apollo hospitals. She is a member of the Gauding Council of ICOG in the past. She was Joint Secretary when Dr. Sanjay Gupta sir was the President of Foxy way back in 2010. And she also has the unique distinction of being the Assistant Coordinator of the National Eclampsia Registry. This is something which is very important and all of us must contribute to this. It's a project which was launched a very long time ago, but I think it's languished a little bit behind. Dr. Giri Chavag is also a national mentor for the Laksha and the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. She's received the Anandi Bhai Soshi Award for Excellence in Medical Services. She's here today to talk to us about a very important topic, and that's the issue of how do we manage eclampsia in low resource settings. When a patient is already admitted and she's in tertiary care, it's very easy to take care of an emergency like eclampsia. But in the periphery where maybe there's a non-MBBS practitioner, there's only an ASHA worker or a primary health center, when they are faced with this life-threatening emergency, how do we prevent maternal mortality? How do we ensure that the woman reaches in a safe condition along with her baby to the closest district or tertiary hospital? That's something which she's going to focus on. Over to Dr. Giri Jawa. Thank you so much for that extremely kind uh introduction and uh, I think Pratik will be again proud of me because since 1st February again over the head of our science department in the University Medical College of Bharati Vidyapi. So I thought I must share that and thank you for your very, very kind that. introduction. Yeah, I, I look at these as opportunities to be able to deliver better for larger population alone. It's not something to be very proud of but it is something that I feel is a pathway towards doing something good. Now, that was an excellent talk by Gorok and wonderful trips on screening. And uh, what I'm going to discuss in my talk is going to be, of course, some understanding about eclampsia, the differentials, pathophysiology, Gorok has already spoken to us. But I'm going to speak only in context of eclampsia and especially how to deliver magnesium sulfate because that has been identified as one single, uh, you know, intervention which will not only prevent the serious consequences of eclampsia, but actually will also help us in treating eclampsia effectively. Now, eclampsia, we all know, is a tonic-clonic seizure or coma in a patient with preeclampsia, and especially sometimes you may not have blood pressure, but there'll be all signs such as of help syndrome. And we must remember that even in a non-proteinuric hypertension, like gestational hypertension, there is a possibility that the woman may throw a seizure. And this is very variable state that you can see her when a woman is convulsing. She's just a 20-year-old woman being brought up to this and this is something which has been shared by my student who is practicing in a lot of official places. So this makes me very proud um, Pratik that you know you are able to reach out to these patients through your students so that they can deliver to their fullest. So this is characterized by onset of seizures in pregnant women and it's a common complication as we all know and it can be life-threatening for both the mother as well as the fetus. Now there is a, despite an advance in detection and management of preeclampsia, eclampsia, it remains a common cause of maternal morbidity and death, especially in resource-limited regions and that is where we are focusing today on. And I think the reason of this futility is a reluctance to understand Maybe the severity of this condition, maybe it occurs sometimes in the life of that particular healthcare provider or a center. And then the complacency towards it that, okay, fine, this is going to happen this way. And that is something where we require to reach out to because we have to understand that every life counts. 
so when dr gorak did mention to us about the pathogenesis what we have to understand is yeah the hypoglyc the hypoxia which sets in because of placental mm -hmm. inadequate circulation gives rise to a lot of cascade of issues which would affect a multi systemic disorder so whenever friends if you have in a low resource setting the moment to find a blood pressure of 140 by 90 or more remember that there is a whole lot of there hiding uh, under the surface which you are not able to decipher and it becomes your duty to find out why the blood pressure is 140 by 90. Secondly, why do seizures occur? That is a very important thing that we have to understand. Popularly, it has been believed because of cerebral vasospasm and cerebral edema, but that happens to be not only the reason because it's been found that the placental ischemia causes release of certain molecules such as neurokinins, inflammatory cytokines, endothelins, and tissue plasminogen activators. And these stimulate excitatory neuronal receptors and alter neuronal excitability, synaptic transmission, and neuronal survival independent of any vascular effects. And complications therefore would be profound, especially we have to also be now conscious about certain women presenting with chronic hypertension and superimposed preeclampsia who are at risk of developing infarcts. And then there could be some seizures which would show focal neurological signs, prolonged coma, atypical or recurrent convulsions, seizures even after delivery can occur, and antihypertensive therapy, seizure prophylaxis, and neurosurgical consultation may also be indicated, and some women also have blindness and press. And so let's look at certain risk factors, and this is where the healthcare provider can always be on alert. Like preeclampsia, if your patient has hypertension, as I mentioned, 149 itself should start shaking your antennae and you should start looking for, is this patient going to be at risk of any such kind of a uh, uh, problem? And what kind of hypertension she has? Is it a chronic hypertension? Is it gestational? Is it preeclampsia? And what are the complications that she's going to get? Immediately, this has to get into our minds. We all know that advanced maternal age has been spoken about, but even a maternal age of young, like younger than 20 years is also important. Nally parity, multifetal gestation, preterm delivery at less than 32 weeks, and lack of prenatal care. It's been found in more than enough studies that inappropriate or inadequate antenatal care has been responsible to do this. Because I must share here with all of you, we have run a sort of, uh, we currently have a cohort of 3,600 women who were screened during their antenatal period under our ICMR project with Bharati Hospital and the Gupte Hospital in Pune. And can you believe it? The incidence of preeclampsia in this entire cohort was only 3%. And this was because they received a good antenatal care, a good diet counseling. So just giving the prefix to wonderful antenatal care would give a lot of you know, respite from this disorder. So several signs and symptoms you must pay attention to, like visual disturbances will be present in 27% of the patients. 66% of them would be having headache. And I have had so many patients being referred to for acidity. They have been given some gelucil or something. And then they have been told that you are hungry, you are hypoglycemic. That's why you had a headache and they landed in a seizure. So do not neglect the complaints that the woman is telling you about headache, visual disturbances right upper quadrant or epigastric pain. Another absolutely very, very common symptom that the woman will come to you, but then that would be ignored. She may sometimes say that, doctor, I'm not feeling well. I'm not able to see clearly. I feel in night, actually, I don't know how when I stumble well, I'm going to the washroom. All these things you must pay attention to. And if you look at the time when eclampsia would occur, it usually is typically seen 38 to 53 percent of the times antipartum. Intrapartum also it may occur. So if you are delivering a patient of hypertension, please ensure that you are giving her magnesium sulfate or at least keeping a watch on her hyperreflexia because she is bound to go in a seizure. And postpartum, after delivery, the story doesn't end. Everybody is very happy looking at the baby. And then generally the doctor is very happy that, oh, wow, I have delivered this patient. But please pay attention to these women. They would come with eclampsia and it's not only immediately within the first 24 to 48 hours. They may come even within the first six weeks. 
and I have had so many patients being misdiagnosed, considering that probably they are hysteric or they are suffering from postnatal depression. No, my friends, they may have eclampsia. And then, of course, there are conditions where there can be atypical eclampsia occurring before 20 weeks of gestation. Convulgence may occur despite adequate magnesium sulfate. And even 48 hours postpartum, which is also called as late postpartum eclampsia. And therefore, we have to be on guard because seizures should be treated promptly with a bolus of intravenous magnesium followed by continuous infusion of magnesium sulfate. And I can very proudly say that I have been witness to the transition time when magnesium sulfate came into our lives. As an intern, we were only giving the lighted cocktail. When I became JR1, and that's how the connotation is nowadays in the medical school, I we started giving magnesium sulfate. And I remember our bosses having fights with their medicine counterparts, where the medicine lecturer would say, why can't you give something else? Why are you giving magnesium sulfate? And now the world has changed over in so many years. This was what I'm telling you 30 years back. And today we have to trust magnesium sulfate because it's here to save lives. And all of us have to be very, very well versed with using it. So if even if there are intractable seizures, resistant eclampsia, you may have to consider tweaking the dose correctly, or maybe then you may consider using other anticonvulsant. Support you care, recovery position, bite protection, supplemental oxygen, all these are indicated. So when we look at the differential diagnosis that should come to your mind are epilepsy, it can be syncope, it can be stroke, it can be intracranial hemorrhage, hypoglycemia or cerebral malaria because we are endemic country for malaria. Now PRES is another entity which was diagnosed by anesthesiologist. And this is something which we have to understand because it is very typically present in association with all eclampsia patients and nearly all of severe hypertension or severe preeclampsia patients. And this is reversible, my friends. But just imagine the profound damage that it may cause to the brain. So this is reversible subcortical vasogenic edema that can occur during pregnancy, most often in association with eclampsia. And it presents as an acute increase in the blood pressure accompanied by headaches, seizures, visual deficits, and altered sensorium. And it's associated with all these conditions I just now mentioned, but that also tells us that it not only damages, it's not only reversible, but it can have a lot of residual problems later on. And this is diagnosed typically on an MRI, wherein you will find that there are typically hyperintense signals which are seen in the white matter tracts of the parieto occipital lobes posteriorly and bilaterally, and this is typically seen in the T2-weighted image which I have put in here. And these are not essential. Like it's not something that a low resource uh, uh, center should say that no, I'll do an MRI and then only diagnose. Remember, all eclampsia have this. And therefore, before this happens, we have to act. And that is what we have to remember. So why does this happen? Basically, there is a vasogenic cerebral edema. There's ischemia of the brain tissue. The posterior circulation apparently seems to be more susceptible and there is less sympathetic innervation of the vertebrogazelar vasculature to protect the parenchyma from rapid increases in arterial blood pressure. And discontinuing the offending medications, lowering the elevated blood pressure, and treating the seizures is the management of this condition. While we are now sitting in this particular decade of, uh, and the new century has started, now we are in the second decade of the century, we have now been hit with a lot of women coming to us with chronic hypertension. And women are becoming older when they present to you in the first pregnancy. They're coming for fertility management. It's not essential that they'll be only in a city-based population. Even at the periphery, patient will spend a lot of money doing ART treatments and then choose to go to their own doctor in their own village for delivery. And we have to be aware of these conditions. And this is chronic hypertension. And chronic hypertension women would be having some very, very small aneurysms in their brains the charcot bouchard aneurysms as they are called, they are present on the deep penetrating arteries and these are especially on the tract of the middle cerebral artery and these weakenings predispose these small vessels to rupture with sudden rise in hypertension. So one of the important treatments which has been realized world over is you have to treat that blood pressure and your golden number is going to be 130, 80, 
which is going to be just enough to maintain the mother's perfusion and the baby's placental perfusion. Do it quickly, but don't do it rapidly. So that is what we have to remember. Now, while I've been telling you all these sad stories, there is good news and eclampsia may be considered a preventable disease in many of the cases. And you can see Gorak has already said that this is what we have decided to take up as a, a sort of a bida that we are going to completely eradicate eclampsia. And this was something which Dr. Sanjay Gupta had also still spoken in 2010. And we all have to join our hands together to help completely eliminate eclampsia from our population. Why do I say so? Because in high income countries, the eclampsia occurred in about 70 per 10,000 pregnancies about 100 years ago. And the maternal case fatality rate in women with eclampsia was 20 to 40 percent. Today, again, in high income countries, eclampsia occurs in less than one in 10,000 pregnancies. And the case fatality rate among women with eclampsia is less than one percent. So dil mange more when our MMR ratios are coming down, we have to say zero or no eclampsia in our populations. What were the improvements? Let's concentrate on that. Progression of eclampsia to eclampsia can be stalled. The case fatality rates of women who developed eclampsia completely reduced. Both complications reduced by about 99%, and most of the reductions in maternal mortality occurred between 1930 and 1970. So while we are in 2022, 23 now, we have to be doing something different and something more better. So magnesium sulfate happened to be the game changer. And this is the drug of choice for treating and preventing eclampsia. It should be continued for at least 24 hours from the time of the last seizure. And the patient should be monitored closely for toxicity. Even with the risk of side effects and toxicity, many studies have proven that magnesium sulfate is much more superior in the treatment of eclampsia compared to any other drugs. So let's look at life before Maxell. Eclampsia was first associated with albuminuria in 1839 and before hypertension in 1897. These discoveries, coupled with the introduction of antenatal care in the first decade of the 20th century, led to better understanding and earlier diagnosis of precursor condition known as preeclampsia. Despite this, mortality from eclampsia remained high in the 20th century and necessitating active search for treatment. And then this was the famous light cocktail. And you can see my wonderful BJ Medical College and Sassoon General Hospital, where I took admission as a resident in JR1 after continuation, after finishing my internship, where I was using the light cocktail. And this is the beautiful campus of the St. Luke's Hospital in Sharampur. And the covered rooms, those dark rooms of eclampsia where we used to manage these patients because we did not want them to be getting any kind of a stimulation. So in second MBBS in the BJGMC Pune, that was around 1984, we were touched this. And in 1989, we continued using this as an intern. And I used to see very, very sick patients of eclampsia. And I was really be feeling so helpless managing them. But what happened in the meantime? There was an intern somewhere in the world who observed magnesium sulfate when used intrathecally in epilepsy had better response. And he therefore proposed that let us try and use it intravenously in patients of eclampsia. So the use of magnesium sulfate for seizure prevention was first described in 1906. And later its use was advocated and sometimes adopted in the United States, but rarely in Great Britain. We know how English are very, very reluctant to do anything. But it gained prominence in the United States and UK during the 1920s. But since the arrival of diazepam, and later of any time, there persisted a hesitance in the use of magnesium sulfate for treating eclamptic seizures. The reluctance stemmed from the widespread use of these medications for other forms of seizures, their cost effectiveness, efficacy, and availability. Now, for eclamptic seizures, prophylaxis in preeclamptic women, magnesium sulfate is superior to phenytoin, nimodipine, diazepam, and placebo. And that's very important that we all have to remember. And the publication of these clinical trials significantly increases the use of Maxell versus other anticonvulsions in the UK and the Ireland, where the reported use in preeclampsia increased from 2 to 40%. 60% of providers surveyed indication indicated that they would use magnesium as an anticonvulsion for eclampsia in 1998 up from only 2% of eclamptic women who received magnesium sulfate in 1992. 
So within six years, there was a change. And therefore, friends, we have to make this change really fast now with so much of access to care. The MACPI trial actually is published in the Lancet in 2002, actually brought about a lot of things. The controversy ended after a landmark study in 1995. This was a publication actually, which showed that MACSELF is superior to diazepam and phenytoin, reduced the risk of recurrent seizures in eclamptic women by 52% when compared to diazepam and by 67% when compared to phenytoin. And the effects of treatment on baby death for those randomized before birth, the perinatal mortality rate was significantly reduced by patients who were given magnesium sulfate. So magnesium sulfate, according to me, and I remember in 2010, everybody used to call me Maxell for Foxy, and that is preventing seizures in women with severe preeclampsia, slowing or stopping premature labor, treating eclampsia, and protecting the brains of the baby, that is a neuroprotector, are three wonderful actions attributed to magnesium sulfate. Because we learned that inflammatory cytokines and the immunological maladaptation starting from abnormal placentation finally results in this very, very destructive pathology of the brain. And therefore, when we are looking at a care algorithm for eclampsia patients, at zero to five minutes, you must use an airway lateral decubitus, always a lateral decubitus. You saw the picture in the video, which I showed the patient was lying like this, very wrong. Put her on a side immediately, do suction, give her oxygen either through the tongs or the bag and mask. Restrain with care, don't tie her up. You can just restrain her with a rail thing or gently, maybe, you know, be there, somebody can be by her side mm -hmm. and protect her, secure an IV line, and then with an 18 to 20 inch of cam submission over five to six minutes, you can give four ampules of 50% weight by volume plus 12 ml or distilled water by 20 ml. You can make an alteration in there. We have a ready-made iMac, which I'm going to speak to about at the end of my talk. And that can be delivered immediately. So you don't have to remember what is the dose. Or what you can do is if the patient is not restrainable, you can just take the four gram magnesium sulfate and give it deep intramuscularly. However, you will have to use a 20 gauge needle for that. So this is something or a simple thing. You can put it in a 100 ml normal saline, put all your four ampules of 50% magnesium sulfate and let it flow over a period of five to 10 minutes. Put in a Foley's catheter, assess her oxygen saturation. We can have those small pulse oximeters which can tell you. Do a quick random blood sugar level because hypoglycemia can be, maybe she's having AFLP, dipstick proteinuria, and attach a multipara monitor. So within the first zero to five minutes, one should be able to do all this. 10 to 15 minutes, take sample for blood and urine for testing because we need to find out whether she's in health. Start her on antihypertensive treatment if conscious. You can give her oral nifedipine, 10 milligrams, slow release formulation, or labitalol, 200 milligrams. If she's unconscious, then you may consider giving her a labitalol drip. Don't give any sublingual nifedipine, please. Magnesium sulfate infusion can be started. That's what we practice in our center. And I'm sure that even in our low resource setting, we can have each of our PHCs are now been granted with a lot of infrastructure. They can be blessed with a syringe pump, wherein you can just chip in 24 amperes of 50% withdrawn in 50 ml syringe attached to the syringe pump, which will deliver this drug at the dose of one gram per hour. If that's not possible, give Pritchard's regimen. Give an intramuscular regimen of loading dose 5 grams in each patak. Assess the patient's history, obstetric parameters. And then you can look at the gestational age, the fetal status, Doppler, NST, Bishop score, etc. Now remember, when the woman is throwing convulsions, the fetal heart rate may not be palpable. Or sometimes, if you are put in an NST, it may be a little deranged. Don't worry, they recover back again. And then... Order for sonography with a Doppler if that is accessible. 15 to 20 minutes, procure the lab reports because these are critical lab reports. They are urgent lab reports, but sometimes in a periphery, your tats may not be so very easy. Your proteinuria itself would give you a clue that, okay, something is not right, and then you can start working. Fetal assessment and plan a delivery. Now, if the patient is stable, you can consider delivery because all eclampsia has to be delivered. There is nothing like expected management when the woman has thrown a convulsion. And obstetric parameters, consider transfer to HDU ICU facility. 
If there are recurrent seizures, repeat the 2-gram bolus after the primary 4-gram dose. Refractory seizures, you can consider giving lorazepam or levera, as we call it, or deep unconscious patient, you may have to consider doing intubation. Now, this is just a demonstration of how you can just chip on the infusion pump. I don't know it's necessary here, but this is how you can how to administer put in a syringe pump. First, I have this all, 5 gram of injection MG is a hole in 50 ml of NS. Now, I'll be, be installing this 50 cc syringe in the infusion pump this, in this manner. Now, once the syringe is installed, it will automatically show an icon where the you will just have to press OK. And no problem. Again, you will have to press OK. Then you will have to adjust, then you will have to adjust the dose. In this case, we will have to administer dose as 10 ml per hour. So, I just increase the dose as 10 ml per hour. And I just have to press start. And the dose is ready to be installed. Thank you. Okay. So you saw that it's very easy to put in that magnesium sulfate and then you don't have to bother because the syringe pump takes care of managing your rate. If you find that the woman is a little hefty, you can make an arrangement of giving her maybe 2 grams per hour rather than 1 gram per hour. And you can quick it. The dose can be adjusted on a syringe pump and you don't require to monitor her so much. And remember that Quantity indications are pulmonary edema, so you must have auscultated the patient already, renal failure, and myasthenia gravis. Always be on guard because a patient may just come to you with hypertension and while you're taking her for examination, as you can see here in this patient, that she has immediately thrown a convulsion. So you should always have a magnesium sulfate box ready and then you must be able and if you are... Can we give an has intramuscular dose? So she has said that, that even if you are not finding an IV axis, you can give it intramuscularly. And remember that one ampule of 50% contains one gram of magnesium sulfate. Magnesium sulfate is very effective in halving the risk of eclampsia when given in severe preeclampsia patients. Substantially more effective than diazepam and phenytoin. And it is known to potentiate the action of adiosone action. It is also known to inhibit the NMDA receptors, improve mitochondrial calcium buffering, and blockage of calcium via voltage gated channels. And this is how you can then put in the final dose of magnesium sulfate. I think the excuse of saying that we are a low resource country all the time is the right. You can see that this is our eclampsia room where she's giving her quick instructions in the first zero to five minutes when the patient of the eclampsia has been gotten and the goosebun regimen is being strapped and given. The WHO, however, says that you give Richard's regimen for the simple reason that you may delay the magnesium sulfate insertion because you don't have an intracalcular actions within the first zero to five minutes. So this maintenance dose of Richard's regimen consists of five ampules of 50% weight by volume magnesium sulfate. And you can use a 1 ml of lignocaine, 2%. It's very important because that will help in keeping her pain away. And it has to be given deep. So you require a long needle so that it has a very high specific gravity. And it has to be given intramuscularly. And it has to be repeated every five hourly after monitoring certain salient features of magnesium sulfate efficacy. I don't like to use the word magnesium sulfate toxicity because in entire 30 years of my existence, I have not seen a single patient of magnesium sulfate toxicity. And that toxicity has got caused us so much of fear that we are very, very uh, you know, scared of sometimes giving magnesium sulfate. Now, this is the magnesium sulfate uh, actions that I mentioned to you, which are very important. But what is very important that I wanted to bring across to you is this is in the United States of America, where they have a 10 gram of magnesium sulfate over a 20 ml. And this is something that they don't have to rake their brains, whether I'm giving one gram, four gram or whatever. And this can be given through the infusion pump and that helps them. And if they are deciding to go a Pritchard's regimen, we all know that five grams will be given in each buttock. The loading will be with four grams IV, five grams in each buttock and then five grams every one hour. Now, I have always been saying that I wish that this would happen in India. Bangladesh, when I had gone to conduct a drill in eclampsia, I was amazed that they already have a pre-loaded uh, IV infusion, which has magnesium sulfate in it, 
And I used to wonder why this doesn't happen in our country. And I'm very proud to say that we have a company here in our country who has come up with IV Mag. And I'm going to tell you at the end of my let us just a few slides now to go. So always, always be on guard with a magnesium sulfate box wherever your pregnant women are going to be, be there, either in the labor room, uh, either in the antenatal OPD, in the wards. You have to have magnesium sulfate box ready, always checked at the beginning of every week so that you know that everything is in place. And in case a woman comes with convulsion or with severe preeclampsia, you are going to definitely deliver the first four grams of magnesium sulfate to her. Again, seeing such patients convulsing is a very, very sad story. So the WHO in its guideline development group in 2011 said that large trials have evaluated and demonstrated the effectiveness of full regimens of magnesium sulfate, which include a loading dose followed by 24 hours maintenance therapy. And even in cases where immediate transfer of the woman to a higher level facility was not possible, the patient was likely to be better off with only the loading dose than without it. So there are various studies and they have said the varied dose schedules confuse practitioners who may not be familiar with magnesium sulfate and the strength of the drug formulation also varies and achieving the correct dilution for IV administration may be prone to error and confusion. And there was this particular study where they found that the health facilities had differing strengths available and used many different dosing schedules. It is important that there be a standard formulation and requirement for adherence to standard dosing schedules to increase appropriate use and optimize action. And in this case, this was the drug which I was talking about, ready to administer solution will resolve the errors in dosage calculations and associated complications where you already have a four gram magnesium sulfate already put in in 100 ml infusion for your loading dose. And what were the observations and care during magnesium sulfate infusion that we need to follow? Continuous CT monitoring if the gestational age is 26 weeks or more. Maternal observations and if you don't have a CTG, you can do an auscultation with a Doppler. Our Dopplers definitely are now very easily accessible. Maternal observations, respiratory rate every 30 minutes, BP monitoring every 30 minutes, maternal pulse hourly, urine output hourly, reflexes at the completion of loading dose and even every two hours. And measurement of serum magnesium sulfate levels are absolutely unnecessary. So when we look at the signs of magnesium sulfate toxicity, respiratory rate less than 10 minutes or SpO2 less than 90%, uh, there can be muscle paralysis or reflexes absent. And usually in the therapeutic dosage, as I mentioned just now, these things don't happen. If at all it is suspected, seize the infusion and take blood for a magnesium sulfate level. And the best thing that is, you know, the guard, the gateway of effective action and increased dosage is the reflexes. So if you have done the reflexes and the patient has reflexes, don't worry, there is no magnesium sulfate toxicity. And if at all there is, you stop the next drug, administer calcium gluconate 10 milligrams IV over 10 to 20 minutes, give her a good oxygen and that should help. So whenever we are looking at the therapeutic range, as I was mentioning to you, the therapeutic range that we avail, achieve by the dosage regimens that I've just mentioned is about five to nine milligrams per deciliter. And if it is more than 3.5, more than seven or more than nine, then only there'll be loss of patellar reflexes. So you are there, you know that there, okay, fine, there are no reflexes, then I'll hold my magnesium sulfate for a while and things should be in place. If there are more than five, that is more than 10 or more than 12, then there'll be respiratory paralysis and more than 30 cardiac arrests. So if you're given magnesium sulfate as per the regimens, you can just put the charts everywhere in your facility and that will never allow you to go wrong. And this is the quick reference chart that I mentioned, which you must put there. Initiate magnesium sulfate for seizure prophylaxis, four to six grams in 100 ml solution IV over 20 minutes. And then you can put it through an infusion pump or again, give it intramuscularly and then maintain the dose at the rate of one to two grams per hour as a continuous infusion, or maybe five grams given in each buttock every five hourly. Give labetrolol and nifedipine, repeat blood pressures every 10 minutes. And if things are not up to the mark, there are some complications you may consider taking consultation of other specialists who may require, who will be required there to be of help. So as I mentioned that 
future is there. Large travels have shown us that you should continue for 24 hours and that's what we have been doing. But there are certain challenges. And what is this future? There are yet needs to determine the optimal duration of magnesium sulfate prophylaxis after delivery for women with preeclampsia with severe features. Because now we are using magnesium sulfate for prevention of eclampsia in women with severe preeclampsia. Now, there is a lot of confusion in the minds of the people that if I have given magnesium sulfate, does it mean that I deliver this patient right away? No. You can wait. She is a severe preeclampsia. That means she must be having systemic involvement. Stabilize her. Give her some opportunity. Maybe if she is a 33-weeker, if you can see that you can correct her anemia, if you can see that the fetal dopplers are allowing you some time, give her antenatal steroids. Your 24-hour magnesium sulfate infusion will award not only liver stabilization, but also neuroprotection to the baby. And then after you have completely controlled her blood pressure, have bought some time, then you can consider delivering her. Do not go beyond 34 weeks, but do not quickly deliver patients which are very, very remote from term because unnecessarily there is going to be an abnormal perinatal outcome. One, for the mother, because she is going to be morbid if you do a C-section, inviting a possibility of placenta percreta in future. And for the baby, because it's going to be premature and going to succumb. So use your balanced clinical decision and rational, and that will help you in taking this decision. So magnesium sulfate is not equivalent to delivery. While eclampsia is equivalent to delivery, this is something that we have to remember. So this duration for severe preeclampsia is yet not clear. And all of us have to put our hands together and decide. In my practice and experience, I have many times given and the maximum times that I have given the magnesium sulfate dosing to the women is for nearly three times before I finally delivered them. And there have been successful outcomes and I always believe a very, very close surveillance by the clinician is the key formula in preventing eclampsia. Second future problem that needs to be considered is whether women presenting with late postpartum preeclampsia with severe features more than 48 hours after delivery will benefit from magnesium sulfate prophylaxis. So this is another question to be answered and which all of us have to put our minds together and come to conclude. Thank you for giving me this space and time and I hope Pratik, I have been able to make justice to the topic and I always am always, you know, very much particular whenever it's a webinar by Pratik because I know what an academician he is and he's very, very particular and specific about whatever he designs. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for a fantastic talk. I think you covered the entire gamut of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, starting from screening, the various classification systems, then going through the treatment modalities and finally you touched upon the cancer. Thank you so much for a very wonderful, updated and very practical talk. You know, sometimes when we get people who speak, they speak a lot of theory. But practically what is to be done, how it is to be followed, you illustrated so wonderfully with videos. There are very few people who actually take the trouble of making videos and sharing these videos on the public platform. Thank you so much. I think that was something which was very instructive. Our audience must have really loved it. Speaking of the audience, we have more than 1,000 who are logged in today. And I specifically wanted to have this program on the Association of World Safe Motherhood Day. And I thought it would be wise to organize it on a public holiday so that we would get maximum attendance. We were lucky, of course, to have two wonderful stalwart speakers. There are a few questions, ma'am. I think Dr. Gorok has stepped into the OT and he has excused himself. So you'll have to answer all of them, unfortunately. No the first one is from Dr. Pallavi and she's from Lucknow and she is asking what is the dose of magnesium sulfate. I think you addressed that. So four grams IV loading dose given over a period of 15 to 20 minutes. And then you give it at one gram per hour. If you have an infusion pump, of course, life is very simple and easy. It's about 25 ml of the 100 ml saline solution, which you spoke about at the end of your talk, IV man. The next question is from Dr. Swati Padhatare. She is from Ahmednagar and she is asking what are the new guidelines on hypertensive disorders of pregnancy? So you want to talk about the GCPR I mean, which we did? 
I will give you a quick uh, Reiki because what she's trying to understand is new guideline of hypertension will be very big. But I must tell you that now there is what has happened new is your threshold for starting antihypertensive medications has reduced considerably. So it was not that you only started at 160, 110 or 150, 100. Even if women have a blood pressure of 140, 90, you are justified in starting the antihypertensive medicine because what happened was in the studies that were analyzed later on, it was found that women had a lot of benefit when antihypertensive medicines were started earlier so that they didn't land in complications and future health concerns, you know. So therefore, whenever you have a woman of 140 by 90, it doesn't affect the placental perfusion at all, especially with the newer antihypertensive medicines like we discussed, the nifedipine and the uh, nicardia or the similar ones and the labetalol. We can give them uh, these antihypertensive medicines which can help us to control the complications. Even the complications of hypertensive disorders were reduced considerably when antihypertensive medicines were started. So that mystery is completely busted. Even in chronic hypertension, you have to give them. So always, always try to maintain. I mentioned it while I was speaking. Keep your blood pressure goal as 130 by 80 and that will help you. And that is one very important thing. The guidelines have been the same. There are a lot of things, however, severe preeclampsia don't go beyond 34 weeks. Gestational hypertension, that new thing that has come is deliver by 37 weeks of gestation. Don't wait for the proteinuria to happen. And proteinuria means severe pre proteinuria means preeclampsia. You must deliver them by 34 weeks of gestation. Do not temporize and give expectant management unnecessarily. There are a lot of clues that you get from the lab, like looking at the uric acid, looking at the patient's labs, even if more than two systems are involved deliver these patients because you and may land in complications very good key practice points and i think the days when we used to keep these women admitted and they used to be called in inverted commas you know chronic patients that should be a thing of the past and we should ensure that you no know, woman is treated as a chronic patient who's just lying in the walls the next question is from dr uma fayas she's from chandrapur in uttar pradesh and she's asking what could be the cause of pih at a young age like 21 Absolutely. I'll tell you what is the age at uh, the young age. See, there are two theories. If you looked at the gestosis score carefully, which Gorak was telling, one of them is immune maladaptation. You understand? So women, if they get married, and you see that most of our government policies are saying that after marriage, please ensure that you, know, you don't get pregnant within one year. There is a reason because there has to be that much sperm exposure. And these are studies. These are evidences which are shown that whenever there is limited sperm exposure, that is, woman becomes uh, gets married, becomes uh, pregnant immediately, she may have yet, she has not adapted to that man's antigenic um, uh, response, and therefore she's not created those antibodies in her body, and therefore she has a very high incidence. Plus, a young woman, her immune system is yet to develop. And therefore, Pratik, I'll just speak a little philosophically here, which many of my colleagues don't agree. I don't know whether you will agree to it or not. I always feel that, you know, our scriptures have been speaking about it. And I went in to find even in the Bible, the Quran, and even in our life living styles, it's mentioned that till the age of 25, you must practice what is called as Brahmacharya Ashram. Because, you know, and then I decided to find why. Let's look at, let's forget the social part of that. But your immune system is yet not mature. You understand the immunological system is yet not mature to deal with pelvic inflammatory disease, to deal with so many viral infections like HPV, to deal with these immunological insults which can come through a sexual and the pregnancy. And that could be the reason that like whenever I go to colleges and talks, I always speak about this. Some of them listen, some of them don't. And we have a lot of debate on this. But this is an immunological maladaptation. The child is still young. The body is still in the phase of formation. But then we have social challenges. And that's why we find that young women get married. Because socially, there is a lot of insecurity. And therefore, they have to be getting married. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. I think that's wisdom from the ages. We are only learning now the scientific reasons behind a lot yeah. of things which we, you know, just mugged up when we were small children. <laughs> all those scriptures <laughs> which we learned. We are now gradually realizing wow. The wisdom of all those sages from so many centuries ago. Next question is from Dr. Shakuntala Nikun. She's from Chhattisgarh and she's asking what is preeclampsia. I think that has already been explained at length. 
by both of our eminent speakers. Dr. Smita Singh from Muzaffarpur in Bihar is asking which IV fluid is preferable and what should be the included dose and rate. I think you showed beautiful videos, ma'am. But in case you want to just repeat that, yeah, the benefit yeah, of the body. Always remember your labor rooms and your critical care places will only have normal saline and RL, ringers lactate. Don't keep anything else. Dextrose, normal saline, five dextrose, all have to go out. They don't. We don't need them. We don't need them in the labor. We don't need them anywhere. So it's only RL. Be the best. Or you can use isolite E, isolite P and all those, but don't use anything else. Thank you, ma'am. I think we have just two more questions. One is from Dr. Vijay Kumar from Daud Nagar in Bihar. And this gentleman is asking, how do we optimize the outcome of the baby in such patients? I think you briefly talked about this, that magnesium sulfate also has the benefit of causing some neuroprotection benefits for the baby as well. Would you like to speak about that? Yeah. Optimizing baby's outcome is in two, three ways. First and foremost is whenever the mother comes to you with eclampsia or severe preeclampsia, they have to be given antihypertensive medicines even with the baby as an interest. And in an eclampsia patient, especially give nasal oxygen and a left recumbent position that will help in better placental perfusion. If you decide to deliver her, don't allow unnecessarily prolonged vaginal delivery because that can cause a fetal uh, issue. And if you're going to do a C-section and if you decide to give regional anesthesia, whichever anesthesia, ensure that the mother is well oxygenated and she doesn't go into hypotension at any cost because hypotension immediately causes placental uh, challenge and the babies will come out sick. And before that, beforehand, definitely ensure for these babies antenatal steroids if they are premature most of them are and give them magnesium sulfate and see that the baby is delivered right into the hands of the neonatologist and nowhere else because that is very important or you can carry the baby to a neonatologist or a center which has one care or you can go get in one there to attend your delivery so these i think would help in creating better outcomes for the babies Absolutely. So I think the concept of in utero transfer, which we used to talk about and ensuring that there is close association with the neonatology team is again of paramount importance in these particular cases. I have just been informed that the live count of the audience has crossed 1100. So that's an amazing turnout for a simple program on just a common disorder, which all of us take for granted, but that speaks volumes for the authority of the speakers that we have today. Thanks yeah. also to the background the team. Look at the felt need. Look at the felt need. I'll tell you, Pratik, when I used to do this critical care eclampsia workshop, workshops in 2010, there used to be a huge crowd coming. Mm -hmm. And that time we had to teach how to give magnesium sulfate. Because most of the centers used to depend on physicians and anesthetists to do that. Today, now we are taking responsibility. That's very nice. And therefore, the felt need continues. It's like, you know, ongoing process like contraception, I feel. <laughs> Agreed. I remember once traveling with Gorab to two or three small places in the interiors where we actually sat and taught people how to take blood pressure of pregnant patients. It started from there, you yeah. know, <laughs> how to actually take blood pressure. Very absolute basics, which we don't even think about. But Absolutely. then there are people who need to learn that. And there are people like us who need to go out into the community and educate those people because that is where the actual need is. There is one person who is probably not logged in. That is Dr. Shweta Lonankar from Mumbai. And she is asking where can we view the recordings in the future? So recordings are proprietary. You know, this is our, you know, our intellectual property. We are not going to give it to you. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. All of the recordings of entire experience series are there on the Science Integra YouTube channel. They are usually uploaded within 24 to 48 hours. So if you get in touch with the Science Integra team who designed the beautiful certificates and the collaterals for these programs, they will be able to share the links also with you. That brings us to the end of the Q&A session. And if there are no further comments from anybody else, then I think I'll present the formal vote of thanks. I'd like to express my gratitude as the chairperson for the MOX Endocrinology Committee to all the audience who's logged in today, to our respected office bearers of MOX, our president, Dr. Rajendra Singh Pardeshi, secretary, Dr. Sujata Darvi, the ICOG office bearers, Dr. Lakshmi Shrikhande and Dr. Ashok Kumar for granting us the ICOG credit points, 
to our chairperson, Dr. Alka Mukherjee, our zonal coordinator of AMOGS, taking time out from her busy schedule, even on a holiday. And two fantastic speakers, Dr. Gorak Mandrukkar, a dear friend, chairperson for the SOPN Guidelines Committee of AMOGS, the person who actually came up with this brilliant innovation of the HDP gestosis score. And of course, a clinician par excellence, Dr. Girija Vag, our vice president elect of Foxy, who spoke brilliantly and very practically illustrated with videos on how to manage eclampsia in low resource settings. I also need to place on record my gratitude to the entire Science Integra team, Ganesh, who is here in the background, Subhu, and the entire backend team of Science Integra, and Blissen Pharma, who are our academic partners for this experience series since the past four months. They are somebody who have been instrumental in bringing out very good practical products, including iron isomaltoside, which incidentally was suggested by Dr. Giri Jaman, I was informed. And also carbacin, that's carbitocin, and IV mag, the subject of today's discussion. Uh, one simple package, 100 ml, 4 grams, no-brainer, very simple, easy to administer, and hopefully it will actually save lives in the interiors where maternal mortality still can be a little bit high. So at the end of today's program, this is Dr. Pratik Tanbe signing off. Until next time, goodbye, God bless, take care, and we hope to see you all very soon. Thank you for logging in. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. And I must Bye. say thank you to Blissarna, really, Pratik. Thanks again. Yes. And I'm Thank speaking you. from Delhi, by the way. I came from the airport. I'm sitting. I've still not checked in. <laughs> so I'll join you tomorrow then. <laughs> okay. Bye. 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 You can take us off air. Eh?